Max Verstappen ruined the Tifosi dream of a Charles Leclerc victory in Monza this past weekend as he edged closer to his second world championship. It was a weekend that started with grid penalties and ended with a safety car. How the FIA handled it and should it have been done differently? All this and more on Unlapped. Mattia Bonotto, I think if he had walked through Monza after Sunday night, there would have been shame, shame, shame around him. Should there be like a timeout of sorts? This is already on a kind of Michael Schumacher, early 2000s Ferrari level. Why are you doing that to Ferrari fans? Unbelievable. You have to bring that back up. Welcome to Unlapped, an ESPN F1 show. I'm Katie George. He's Lawrence Edmondson. It's just the two of us this week, Lawrence, so we're going to dive right in. Remember, if you're watching on YouTube, like this video, leave us a comment on what you want to hear more of, and don't forget to subscribe to ESPN for more F1 content. If you're listening, of course, hit us with a five-star review wherever you get your podcast. Quick bit of news before we dive into Monza. Let's start with Alex Albon, Lawrence. Uh, Unfortunately, he had appendicitis on Saturday, was rushed to the hospital, and then has had a lot of complications since, but we've heard some good news and he should be home on Tuesday. What's the latest that you're hearing about Alex? So it does sound like he's making a recovery, but yeah, it was very concerning. He went in with appendicitis on Saturday morning. It's quite rare. We see that a driver just pull out of a race midway through a weekend, but he had to do it. He had appendicitis and it's really quite nasty. It's quite serious. It required some surgery. And then there was uh, complications uh, during the surgery after the surgery. And uh, he had to go into intensive care overnight. Um, We didn't know that at the time, so the race kind of went ahead and no one was really aware of it. And then Williams, fortunately, by Monday, Alex was feeling much better and Williams was able to give us that good news. And remarkably, despite all this, you know, all these hits to his system, he's planning to get back in the car in Singapore, which is physically one of the toughest races on the calendar, if not the toughest. So um, it shows you how incredibly fit these guys are. But yeah, I mean, best wishes to Alex for a, a speedy recovery because all of that sounded pretty nasty. Yeah, luckily for him, he's got time on his side. It's not like he's got a back-to-back where he's trying to get ready for a race this weekend. But Singapore is on October 2nd, as you mentioned, a very hot, humid race. I've never personally been there, but you say that the elements can be pretty tricky for these drivers, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, they sweat bucket loads. You know, they they lose liters of sweat and, you know, and they really have to worry about that they have to cool their core temperature down before they have to take on lots of fluids uh, they sometimes do training beforehand in saunas and stuff like that i've heard stories of drivers taking it to extremes like that just to prepare themselves for it because you step off the plane in singapore and it just hits you it's humidity so you're so close to the equator so muggy um it's yeah unlike anywhere else they race at the moment they used to race in malaysia and kuala lumpur which also very close to the equator uh that was a day race that really was hard work for them but yeah even singapore's a night race it's a tough one so yeah best of luck to alex because uh it's not just about being fit the day before the race it's also about making sure you get in all that essential training to make sure that your mind is working 100 percent throughout that race because it's a long one as well yeah well, we hope that he has a speedy recovery and that we see him uh as soon as singapore Williams went to Nick DeVries and Nick DeVries did an excellent job in the Williams uh, at Monza. We'll discuss that as we continue on. And we also are seeing reports that F1 CEO Stefano Domenicale is suggesting that they should possibly look into restructuring points and the way that points are given out, possibly starting on Fridays and free practice. We obviously have the sprint races in place, but maybe we'll see more of those. What did you make of his comments throughout the weekend? Yeah, so this came from Stefano Domenicali through the Italian press. And the idea basically being is that, you know, we introduced sprint races a couple of years ago. Well, let's take it even further and ha- potentially have reverse grids, something we talked about before, and maybe even points for practice sessions, which is pretty alien to Formula One. You know, usually a practice session, the drivers just go out, they get used to their cars, they set them up for qualifying. You know, it's all part of the structure, the rhythm of a weekend. Uh, so if you start adding points and a competitive element to that, I mean, it's kind of exciting. There's a little bit more on the line, but it does kind of change things a little bit. Uh, Teams will have to structure their weekends differently. Now, a bit of change never hurt anyone, right? You know, Formula One for many years has been very similar. And at times they've changed the point system to try and allow to stop drivers running away with the championship. At times they've changed the qualifying system to try and make it more exciting. Uh, And then, of course, we had the introduction of the sprint races. So, you know, it's not unheard of that Formula One tweaks the the format slightly to try and find something that's more exciting, but F1 really seems to be pushing this. And above all else, it's that we have three days of 
stuff that's exciting to watch rather than two one-hour practice sessions on a Friday have what we have of a sprint weekend where you have a qualifying session on a Friday and then that sets a grid for a sprint race on Saturday and Stefano it seems to be from what I've read I mean I didn't hear him say these words but it seems like he's maybe talking about a reverse grid now when that was suggested a couple of years ago (laughs) lots of F1 purists just you know were rebelling against it did not want it Toto Wolf uh, compared it to WWE as (laughs) an idea and so yeah I I always think when you hear these things especially when they kind of come out maybe to one or two journalists it's just testing the water it's like here's how extreme we could go now how about we change something that's kind of in between how about we add more sprint races to next year things like that so it's um I think it's good though that we've got uh a CEO in charge of Stefano Domenicali uh, and uh, management in Formula One who are willing to try different ideas because you know what, we've got 24 races coming up next year. A bit of variation in those 24 won't do anyone any harm, I don't think. It's always fascinating. There's always something in the works, right? And there needs to be. You always should be having these discussions because as a, an entity, you have to be evolving with the times. And to your point, you know, they they try to hinder maybe one driver running away with the championship. Alas, that uh, has not happened this season. Uh, Haas is always um, on our topical of mine because we don't know who's going to be driving for them in 2023 for sure there's a seat there will it be Mick Schumacher will it be Nico Hulkenberg that's a name that has been getting a lot of attention as of late we've seen Hulkenberg just this season stand in for for Seb when Seb had COVID earlier on the season we saw him stand in uh, last season and the last time we saw him on the grid was in 2019 with Renault and then Daniel Ricciardo took that spot so what do you think about Nico Hulkenberg returning to F1 well, credit to my good friend and colleague, Nate Saunders, who mm-hmm. managed to get this story while in Monza, that uh, Haas is seriously considering Hulkenberg as an option. Now, that's kind of come out of nowhere because as much as everyone rates Nico Hulkenberg, he had a very long career in Formula 1, famously, infamously, didn't score Number a podium one. in that career. And people were wondering, you know, maybe, you know, that's the end of it. And sure, he's been the super sub, uh, especially for Racing Point and then Aston Martin when it changed names. And he's Every time he's come in, he's performed well. But, you know, is he the future of any of those teams? That was questionable. But, hey, look, you know, if Haas are interested, uh, that's great. Uh, Haas are also looking at their options. I mean, they've got Mick Schumacher there at the moment. Mick's picking up a bit, but they made quite clear early in the year that Mick really needs to do a lot better to hold that seat. So could this be a negotiating tactic? Could they be putting out there, look, we're interested in Nico just to get Mick kind of, you know, a little bit more aligned with what they want from him and whether that be demands over money or whatever, it's hard to know. But this is why we love this period of the season when there's a few open Mm -hmm. seats at different teams and yet there's a number of drivers capable of filling those because it puts a bit of competition in there and the drivers either have to up their game um, or basically, you know, prove themselves that they're the ones that should get it. So, uh, yeah, Nico Hulkenberg back in there. Now, it was only, I think, in the last podcast we did, we were talking about how Alpine had their eyes on Pierre Gasly and for that to happen, Colton Herter was going to make a switch from IndyCar to Alpha Tauri to free up Gasly's place. Now, that's probably not going to happen now because all the all the signs are that Colton Herter isn't going to get that super license. Again, we talked about that a lot in the last podcast if you want more detail on it. But um, yeah, the signs are that might not happen now. So Alpine aren't going to get hold of Gasly if, if, if Alpha Tauri can't replace him with Herta. So sure. they're now looking down the list of names. They're looking at Nick De Vries, of course, who we now know put in that amazing performance at Monza, really put himself in the shop window there to get a seat next year. Uh, they're looking at Jack Doohan, who is a young Australian driver currently in F2. Um, he's in their academy. Now, let's not forget what happened to Oscar Piastri. He was a member of their academy <laughs> and then got <laughs> stolen by a rival team. They don't want that to happen again. So they're now looking at Jack Doohan and say, well, maybe... Maybe we promote him earlier than we'd originally planned. And you know what? The other driver who's been uh, knocked around by Alpine as a as a potential, it's really more of a rumor than anything else, is our good friend Nico Hulkenberg again. So all of a sudden, it's just blown wide open. And like I said, you've got a lot of a lot of names who are who are good enough to land these seats, and would be interesting to see in F one whether they're making comebacks like Nico Hulkenberg or they're making debuts like Jack Doohan or Nick De Vries essentially would be making his first full season. So um, it's an interesting time. And yeah, we'll have to keep an eye on everything with these things. It's always jigsaw puzzles falling into place. place. And uh, really, once we get one or two 
drivers making decisions. Uh, De Vries also has an option at Williams, for example. Uh, okay. Once they start to make their decisions, then everything else will fall into place and we'll see where um, where everyone goes. The one name that isn't really getting much mention for these available seats is Daniel Ricciardo. Mm. And uh, that really hints that maybe he is considering taking a sabbatical of some sort, whether that's still tied with a team. Mercedes was rumoured with Ricciardo as a reserve driver. Maybe, but and um, we'll have to wait and see. But uh, I'm not ruling out anything at this stage. And uh, yeah, for Nico Hulkenberg to come back seemed unlikely just a few weeks ago. Now it's on the cards. From your experience, does Haas have time on their side? Do they need to make a decision here quickly or can they wait to the end of the season? I think uh, Haas tend to wait. They do tend to wait on these things. And Gunter Steiner is very good at batting away questions and saying, mm-hmm. look, we're going to wait for you know everything else to fall into place. They've got options. They've got, um, you know, Haas is a more appealing option than maybe it was uh, a year ago when they were really at the back of the grid. So they've got a little bit of bargaining power there as well. But um, they've also got Kevin Magnussen under contract. And we know Kevin is a very good, solid option. So I don't think they're worrying too much. I think they also know that if they want him, they can get Mick Schumacher. And I think they also know if they wanted Antonio Giovinazzi, uh, who, of course, is doing a couple of practice sessions for them, he could come in as well. So they know they've got options there. It's just really them trying to figure out who's the most competitive guy, I guess, also at the best price in terms of what they pay them. Mm -hmm. Fair enough. All right. Well, we'll wait for that domino to fall and then all the rest to follow suit. All right. Let's dive into the Italian Grand Prix. Max Verstappen, after taking a grid penalty, along with what felt like every other driver as well, started seventh on the grid on Sunday and quickly made work of all those in front of him. Another just excellent performance from him. He's so unbelievably consistent. It was his 11th win of the season, Lawrence. What just impressed, I feel like I ask this question every single week, what impressed you about his performance again? Well, I think going to a completely different type of track. So we saw him mega at Spa, we saw him mega at Zandvoort, then he comes to Monza and we were like, well, maybe this will suit Ferrari. Mm -hmm. Of course, Leclerc got pole legitimately. Max had a a grid penalty, but Leclerc was faster than him in qualifying. And then Max had to do it from seventh on the grid. Now, we knew in Spa, he did it from... uh, 14th on the grid is actually 13th once another driver being removed from the grid. Um, and so we knew he could do it, but Monza's a bit harder to overtake. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, it's not quite as easy just to get up behind somebody with a DRS and overtake as it is in Spa. And yet he did it. And he did it super quick. Again, just going through the field and putting Ferrari in a position where strategically in the end, they were kind of between a rock and a hard place. And uh, really it was just, again, that phenomenal speed that Max has found in that car of late. You know, I really do think at the start of the year, um, while he was very good, of course, he was still winning races. He hadn't quite clicked with the car and now he has, and they've developed it around him. And what we've got now is a driver who just looks set to dominate, not just this season, but we could be thinking several seasons down the line. You know, this is already on a kind of Michael Schumacher early 2000s Ferrari level or a Sebastian Vettel early 2010s Red Bull or, of course, Lewis Hamilton Mercedes era uh, level. It, it is that good. And, um, yeah, he's uh, he's on another level right now. Correct me if I'm wrong. Michael Schumacher holds the record for most wins in a season at 13. And then Seb has also hit that mark as well with 13, but maybe had a couple more races the year that he was able to do it. That's right. So um, it was Michael Schumacher had... 13 wins from 18 races in 2004. Seb, I think it was 2011, had his 13 wins from 19 races. Now, Max is already on 11 wins with (laughs) six races left to run, and it would be a brave person who betted against Max winning all six of those races, (laughs) to be honest. And then that just sets the record at another level. I know he's had 22 races to do it in, but even by the time uh, we we reach round 18, he could be on uh, 13 wins as well. So, yeah, that just that just basically explains it, doesn't it? That's the level he is on. And um, whilst, you know, we have seen periods of dominance uh, in Formula One, uh, it's it's rare that it's quite this, this extreme. And also he's got the potential, Max, to seal the deal, seal the title in Singapore at the next round. I think it's unlikely because it requires Leclerc to finish ninth or below, but you never know. Things have gone wrong for Fry this year. They may do again. But um, if he did that, he would win the title with five races remaining, which is also quite a rare feat. I think Michael, again, has the record on that with six races remaining. 
but either way, look, he's going to seal it um, with with plenty of, of races left to run. So, uh, yeah, I mean, congratulations to Red Bull and, and Max, but we are wondering where's the next competitive title battle going to come from. I think it's telling when your stiffest competition from a season ago and Lewis Hamilton says that he fears Max Verstappen at this point is unbeatable. Not only is he a phenomenal driver, that is a phenomenal machine that they have put together. You mentioned Singapore. There's six races left. Singapore, Japan, Austin in the United States, Mexico, Brazil, and then Abu Dhabi. So, yes, I think that he could not only tie Schumacher and Vettel, but he could overtake that record quite easily based on the performances he's put together as of late. You mentioned Charles Leclerc. He finishes second on the podium. George Russell for Mercedes finished third. Do you think that pitting early behind a virtual safety car was a mistake? Should we chastise the strategy from Ferrari, or do you think that they did, did the best that they could with how the race unfolded? So that situation with the virtual safety car, uh, Ferrari basically had two options. They could either pit from the lead and try and get essentially a quicker pit stop because you lose less time relative to everyone else if there's a virtual safety car out because everyone else is moving slower on track. Now, they got a little bit unlucky because the virtual safety car ended whilst the clerk was still in the pit lane. So they didn't get the full benefit of that early pit stop that they would have had in terms of race time okay. normally. So that was unfortunate. That was unfortunate. The other thing is that had Leclerc not pitted, Red Bull were ready to bring in Max. So it was um, one of those situations where you either try and take that punt yourself or Red Bull are going to do it behind. And Red Bull admitted this after race. They said, we were absolutely going to do the opposite uh, to what Leclerc did. And so really, I mean, at the end of the day, it was the pace of the Red Bull. I can't mm -hmm. really envisage a situation, no matter what they'd done with strategy, where Leclerc would have held off for Stappen. And so, um, yeah, that's just, that's the way it went. But they had to try something. You know, I feel like there's other times when Ferrari have clearly dropped the ball. But with this one, they had to try something. If they didn't try it, Red Bull would have tried it. Now, what would have been interesting, of course, is that Verstappen was further back. And so had he come in under the virtual safety car, it would have ended even quicker for him in the pit lane, which meant there'd be even less advantage. So that may have set up a bit of a race, but of course, Ferrari, there's no knowing when the virtual safety car ends. It's it's relatively random in terms of what race control decide to do there. So yeah, um, it was it was bad luck for Ferrari to some extent, but I just don't think they had the pace in Monza. Yeah, I don't think it necessarily would have mattered. It was like Zandvoort, right? Like even if Mercedes had maybe done a different strategy at the very end, I think Max Verstappen has the machine to be able to overtake both of those guys uh, and win that race. So kind of similar there. Uh, I do think watching Carlos Sainz um, go from, what was it, 18th, 19th, 18th, I think is where he started with the grid penalty to work his way through and to come back and finish fourth, I thought was very, very telling. I know Charles was a little bit disappointed with the second um, place, but I thought Sainz really did a nice job and that was an impressive day from him. Yeah, it was. And nice that the Ferrari fans, of which there were many there, it was a real sellout crowd in Monza. We don't, haven't seen that every year, you know, in recent okay. seasons. Um, to see science come through the field, at least that was something for them to get behind. And uh, you could hear, you could hear the crowd cheering every time he made an overtake. Um, awesome. So that was, that was good to see. And I'm sure like science enjoyed that. Of course, he would have much rather started from the front and had a shot of victory as well. And Ferrari would have loved that because they would have had two cars to play with strategy then. So maybe they would have been in a better situation to try and hold off Max. But um, yeah, at least that was a silver lining for another wise, pretty dark day for Ferrari at Monza. All right. We're going to um, obviously address the elephant in the room. And that was the safety car that we saw towards the end of the race. There seemed to be a lot of confusion about the safety car originally when it came out. He could not find she. I'm not sure who's driving the safety car. They couldn't find the race leader being Max Verstappen at that point. Uh, and instead, they picked up with George Russell. Can you just take us through the confusion that was and then ultimately how things played out? Yeah, so there was a bit of upset around this because, of course, the race didn't then start again. Uh, you know, the safety car never returned to the pits to allow the race to, to continue. It ended under the safety car. So that's why everyone was a bit annoyed about it. But these things do happen. And when the safety car comes out, it's for a good reason. And in this case, it was Daniel Ricciardo's car stuck at the side of the track, stuck in gear. So the marshals couldn't just push it to an opening in the fence. They had to get a crane out onto the track, a mobile crane and lift it. And of course, whenever that happens, 
the FIA race control is very wary of the consequences because we learned in 2014 with Jules Bianchi's accident that led to his death that if a car goes into the back of one of those cranes, it is a horrible, horrible mess. Mm-hmm. So, um, so they had to they had to get the safety car out there in order to get rid of Daniel Ricciardo's car from the track as quickly as possible. Now, the safety car, it was great when it comes out in front of the leader. It's meant to find the leader, but sometimes that's just not possible. And in this case, they were trying to get that car clear as, as quick as possible. So it picked up George Russell, and then all the cars bunched behind him. But that meant that Verstappen was at the back of that bunch because he was halfway around the track when the safety car came out and so joined the back of it. And so you had all the cars in the wrong order. Now, of course, you can't restart the race like that. So by the time they had got rid of Ricardo's car, um, they then had to reshuffle the order, let drivers through, and so that Verstappen was then the first car behind the safety car. And then you've got to get rid of the lap cars in between, which we know from... Um, the Abu Dhabi season finale last year is a very important thing to do. And within the regulations, the all unlapped cars that stuck between other cars must unlap themselves and uh, rejoin the back of the pack. And the fact is, by the end of it, they didn't have enough time. Arguably, they could have started organising the order a little bit earlier. Mattia Bonotto was yeah. on uh, Sky Sports saying as much after the race that he felt that you know they should have much earlier uh, released George Russell from behind so that you get Verstappen at the front and then get all the cars in line. Uh, the problem with that is that they were still clearing Daniel Ricciardo's car and there is video footage of the cars going past in the safety car train and they're still going quite fast past that that mobile crane and so realistically i think they did what was safe and what was the right thing to do and yeah like i said then you know the clues in the name the safety car it's about making the situation as safe as possible and then if you get a chance to restart you restart but there's nothing in the rules that says you have to force a restart the teams will want to see racing on the final lap everyone wants to see the race finish under a green flag conditions but it's just not always possible and in this case it wasn't. Now, of course, there's parallels to Abu Dhabi where they kind of forced that a little bit. And uh, of course, that didn't go unnoticed at the end of uh, the race. But yeah, in this situation, while it wasn't perfect, I think given the emphasis on safety, they did the right thing. Okay. Obviously, Lewis Hamilton had some nightmares uh, from a year ago, as you mentioned. He had some strong comments after the race. Let me ask you this. As we're talking about possibly restructuring points and the FIA is always looking to evolve, Do you think there should be a situation where if something like this does happen and we're possibly going to end a race under a safety car, should there be like a timeout of sorts where people go back to the pits, they stay in their cars, they're not able to adjust anything in that moment, but there's a timeout which gives the marshals time to clear Daniel Ricciardo's car and then they restart all together and we can see racing to the end. Yeah. So this was brought up by a number of people after the race. And I think, in this circumstance, it would have been far more entertaining, wouldn't it? We would sure. have seen the race finish off. We would have seen maybe Charles Leclerc being able to have a go at Max Verstappen, up Monza for the victory for Ferrari. And that would be great. And personally, yes, I think I think that would make the sport more exciting. It would lead to more exciting finishes uh, to races because finishing behind a safety car is not always ideal. But there would always be the danger that there's another situation where, let's say, I don't know, I'm just going to pick a name at random. Mm-hmm. Sebastian Vettel and then Aston Martin is leading on the final lap of his final race in, in Abu Dhabi. And then um, had the race ended under a safety car, he would have won his final race and it would have been this brilliant story. But they did this red flag thing and then they restarted the race and he got easily passed into the first corner. And then by, let's say, Max Verstappen, who had just won the last five races, then everyone would be like, oh, why did we ever change it? You know, we could have had a yeah. Sebastian Vettel. So you've got to be careful what you wish for. You've got to look at all the options. Mm-hmm. And... You know, F1 did go through all of this after Abu Dhabi. They looked at potential options of better ways of finishing races. And while everyone agreed that it's not ideal to finish a a race under a safety car, they also couldn't agree on another way to do it. So they have already had this conversation. I do wonder whether the Monza thing, because, you know, it did seem a bit clumsy and it was such a big anticlimax, will maybe change a few minds on that. And as we know, with Stefano Domenicali's comments we talked about earlier in the show, uh, there's always appetite to kind of maybe change things and continue to push ideas, even if they were rejected the first time. So I think it'd be interesting if we saw that. I don't really see a, see a downside to doing that, a kind of red flag situation at the end of mm-hmm. the race to make sure we get at least one or two racing laps if a safety car's out there towards the end. Uh, the only downside is that, you know, it can be quite a 
slow process, bringing all the cars into the pits, sending them all back out, gridding them up, letting them go. Uh, but, you know, as long as the TV companies don't mind having that extra slot of window, no, you know, if, 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 if they get a better show, uh, then I, it's the kind of thing I would actually be all for. But again, we'll have this whole debate between the ones that want the entertainment and the purists who say, you know, motor racing is just the way it is. Leave it how it is, you know. Uh, but I think first and foremost, it's got to be safety first. And in this instance, with the regulations we have at the moment, that's exactly what the FIA did in Monza. Uh, whether we then change that going forward, I think it's a good conversation to open. But um, I'd be surprised given that it was pretty much rejected after Abu Dhabi. I love that you're manifesting a Sebastian Vettel win in his last race in Abu Dhabi. I could get behind that very Wishful easily. thinking, I think, on my part. Oh, yeah. I, just, <laughs> well, I want to sure. see that guy get the send-off he deserves. But yeah. I know. That would be awesome. Uh, George Russell, he qualified sixth, and then he started on the front row because of some of the penalties we had mentioned. He's now 16 points back from second place in the Drivers' Championship. I've just been so impressed with his consistency. Obviously, it's not to the level – that we were seeing from Max Verstappen, but he has been in the conversation on so many podiums this season. You know, what's just, I guess, stood out about his performances time and time again for Mercedes in his first year in that seat. I think you hit the nail on the head right there. This is his first year at a top team. We saw again and again at Williams, there were these flashes of brilliance and moments, but we always thought, you know, all well and good doing that at the back of the grid when the pressure's off. But when you're a, a top team, can you do it consistently? And George has answered, yes, he can. Um, the other thing about that, uh, did you say 16 points between him and the clerk yeah. in second? Can you imagine? <laughs> I mean, this sounds a bit mean, but can you imagine if Max wasn't a part of this championship and how close it would be between everyone else? You know, if Max yeah. wasn't quite Unreal. as good as he was, it would be a fantastic year, wouldn't it? And we've, look, we've had this before when Lewis has run away with championships. You often look at the rest of the field and you're like, wow, that could be an incredibly exciting championship. Um, of course, the thing is, when it's for second place, no one really cares because, as they say in Formula 1, you're the first of the losers. But it is, it is to go back to your first point, yeah, George Russell this year has been, has been phenomenal. And look, he looks like he's going to finish a championship ahead of uh, Lewis Hamilton on his current form. And anyone that can do that, we know, is, you know, is a very serious racing driver. Valtteri Bottas had five goes at it, couldn't do it. Nico Rosberg eventually managed it at the end of his career, had to retire the following year. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's a real accomplishment. So if he can do that first year Mercedes, uh, that's great. I think, um, of course, you know, it's not all gone Lewis's way. I'm sure you can make an argument to say that Lewis could quite easily be up there with George had things gone differently at the start of the year. And it will be interesting when they're both in a properly competitive car. Uh, with potentially a championship on the line, what happens. And hopefully we'll see that in future years if Lewis hangs around. But um, Mercedes will be very happy that um, despite the fact that Lewis's career is coming to an end, I mean, whether it's the end of his contract at the end of 2023 or a couple of years later, they know now they've got a real serious driver in George Russell to last them as long as they can give him a competitive car and keep him in the contract. I think it's a great point by you. It's one thing to do that in your first year with the new team. It's another thing to do that alongside Lewis Hamilton. There's, I think, an intimidation factor there. There's a pressure that comes with that as well. And George Russell has seemed to handle it extremely well uh, this season thus far. Speaking of Lewis, he started 19th because of a power unit grid penalty, and then he worked his way up. He did get stuck, uh, obviously, there in that train for a little bit, but he finished fifth. So Mercedes is 35 points um, from second place in the Constructors' Championship. So as you mentioned, thinking back to how they started the season to where they are now, they've definitely made great strides. I do want to mention Nick DeVries because what a weekend he had. Take me through it because to do what he did in a Williams, I mean, we've been seeing Nicholas Latifi race this entire season and he hasn't been able to accomplish what we just saw DeVries accomplish. Yeah, that's right. And also Nick DeVries started the weekend at Aston Martin <laughs> as a FP1 kind of test reserve driver. I bet his you know, head but- was swirling. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, yeah. and that's also an accomplishment because these cars, although, you know, they're all performing on a similar level, they're quite different in the way you operate them, the switches on the steering wheel, all of that kind of stuff. And um, around a track like that, which is not an easy track, um, it, it's impressive. And what's more, I mean, look, everything Nick DeVries did this weekend, easily outqualifying his teammate. Uh, sure, he benefited from some grid penalties for other drivers, but then still performed in the race. You know, he could have easily dropped down the field uh, had he not been up to up to scratch, but he didn't. He held position and he took the fight to a number of drivers. But also to do that in a car that isn't 
built around you. you know, it's very yeah. impressive. He, he had real shoulder pains. And I think part of that was just because of the way the seatbelts kind of came over his shoulders. Uh, he's quite lucky in that he's relatively small and it's much harder if you're a very tall driver trying to squash yourself into a cockpit. Okay. But, um, but he still wasn't comfortable. You know, the seat wasn't properly fitted to him. And so at the end of the race, he couldn't get himself out of the car. There's, you'll find it on Twitter, on Instagram, uh, on F1.com or whatever. But there's this video of him in the car calling to his engineer and saying, uh, is someone allowed to come and help me because I'm actually stuck in the car? I cannot get out. And, uh, you know, this is a fit racing driver. He's done, he's done a year in, uh, in Formula E, of course. Uh, he's a champion of Formula E from uh, previous year as well. Uh, so he's, we know he's very good, but it does show you that extra level of uh, physicality, essentially, in, in Formula 1 and at a racetrack like Monza where they try and strip all the downforce off the car. It's got skinny wings. It's moving around at high speeds. And he was just up to that level. So um, what really pleases me about this is that it puts him in a position to say, look, I deserve to be on the grid next year. And ever since he won his Formula 2 title, I think a lot of people have felt, you know, he didn't really get a proper shot at it. Many people criticised him for that Formula 2. Well, not criticised him, but said that the field wasn't particularly strong in that Formula 2 year. Therefore, it's not as kind of great as George Russell's Formula 2 victory championship or Charles Leclerc's. But, you know, I think he's proven that he he deserves to be in F1. So um, now that it looks like he's got interest from Williams, certainly, uh, potentially Alpine as well, I hope to see him on the grid next year. I think it's always incredible. Incredible when you see a young driver who, as you mentioned, is waiting and working so hard for that opportunity. When the opportunity finally comes in that kind of scenario for them to step in and make the most of it, I think that's exactly what we saw him do. And you applaud him and you hope that it does ultimately get him a seat in 2023, certainly. So we'll, of course, wait to see what happens there. I do want to pivot to the doghouse. <laughs> We had a lot of DNFs uh, this weekend. So who are you putting in the doghouse and why? It has to be Nicholas Latifi, the other half of the Williams uh, garage there, because look, here's a guy who his seat is on the line. We were not really mm -hmm. expecting Nicholas Latifi to be renewed for another year. You go to Monza, a track where the Williams is actually quite well suited. It stands a chance. Uh, you're regular teammate who is really very good Alex Albon gets appendicitis it's your time to shine it's your time to lead the team uh to a points finish which was clearly what was possible yet Nick De Vries stands in out qualifies him outperforms him in the race and you know it's already been talked about almost quite openly by Williams as their first choice ahead of Nicholas Latifi for next year and so you know, I mean, uh, I think there's a number of occasions we probably could have put Latifi in the doghouse, but we always gave yes. him a bit of an easy ride because, you know, it's a tricky car to drive. Uh, I think expectations as well, let's be honest, are never set that high with, with Latifi, but this time it was just kind of all all a bit too obvious. And um, shame because he's a nice guy, but yeah, in, in Formula 1, you have to perform. And uh, yeah. at a time when he probably had an opportunity to, you know, to perform better than his teammate probably should have given all his experience in that car. He didn't. How about you? I, I mean, there's, there's no Nate here, so we definitely need someone else in the doghouse. We can't have... I was going to say, I don't want to leave him... I don't want to leave him alone, but Nate usually throws in an entire team, so it gets really crowded <laughs> in the doghouse. Uh, I was upset about the DNF with Alonzo. I mean, for somebody who's in such good form as of right now, I thought that was... Um, underwhelming and then i would throw maybe aston martin i'd throw their team in to have both of your drivers dnf um that was very unfortunate not to say that you know those guys would have been fighting for podiums but you can't have both your drivers out of the race like that no i think that's fair and also with alonso it just didn't really click i mean i mm -hmm. i don't know if we're going to do the prediction thing later but i had him as uh yeah. on my podium for the predictions okay it was kind of like let's hope something happens in the race and we get it something felt like exciting. it was trending that alonso way for him it. It, it did, yes. Yeah, and of course, it brought an end to that run of, uh, of great results for him. I mean, the DNF, like, not particularly his fault. But yeah, it just didn't seem like um, it was quite working for him. Perhaps, uh, I haven't gone into the details of exactly what happened with the car, but it seems like there was obviously an issue with the car. And he was complaining uh, midway through the race that he wasn't getting the electrical power from his hybrid system. And so, yeah, it, perhaps it wasn't all on Fernando. But yeah, I'd definitely put uh, Alpine in there for, for DNFing out of that one because it should have been a strong race. Yeah, throw some engineers in there with that many DNFs, <laughs> you know, only right. Uh, we've got three weeks until uh, we get to our next race in Singapore. 
Do you think, because there's obviously rumors always swirling about which races are going to be back on the calendar in 2023, do you think we'll have some clarity of what that calendar will look like by the time we get to Singapore? And do you think that some of those empty seats for 2023 will ultimately be filled? Yeah, I mean, I hope we have some clarity about <laughs> next year's calendar because there's a lot of people trying to book flights and hotels. You know, I yeah. mean, you like to get an early glance at the calendar if you're working in Formula One because it means you can book into hotels uh, before the fans do. I mean, look, I love it that so many fans turn up at races, but it actually becomes quite difficult to logistically <laughs> sure. move around the world if you don't have some kind of foresight of what's going on. So I hope we get um, something close to a calendar. We've seen a few rumoured things. Clearly, there's a few contracts yet to be signed monaco's one we've seen uh flying around in recent days talk of it being signed perhaps not quite being signed yet all the rest of it but there's a few like that where i think that we're going to have monaco on the calendar next year but there's a few others uh which are up in the air and i i guess um those are the ones that f1 wants to nail down before it puts out this calendar uh for next year but it's usually around now we always used to say in monza you would get a calendar for the following year uh that's Sometimes trends a bit later in, in seasons where it's complicated and things like China, you know, it's still very complicated to get everyone into China for, for a motor race. You know, it's not an easy place to access at the moment. So uh, no doubt that's part of what's holding it up. Um, then in terms of the drivers and who's driving where for next year, uh, it's, it's, hard, it's hard to know. I, like I said earlier, I think sometimes that first domino falls and then everything goes after it. Mm -hmm. But um, right now, there's no obvious reason for a rush. Uh, there's talk that Alpine are testing a few drivers. Nick De Vries is one of them. They've got to test mm -hmm. it in last year's car because they're not allowed to test this year's car under F1's regulations. Uh, but uh, Jack Dewan's in there as well. Um, and so apparently Colson Herter as well, although that's coming from the Red Bull side, putting him in an Alpine to test. So, the fact you've got all of this going on, it seems like these decisions are taking a lot of thought. There's a lot of options out there. But um, if one team and one driver connect and go for it, so let's say De Vries gets taken off the market by Alpine, then all of a sudden I think it speeds everything else up. But um, I wouldn't I wouldn't hold your breath. I wouldn't hold your breath for uh, anything immediately. Probably famous last words and it'll get announced by the time people listen to this podcast. But uh, as far as I know, nothing immediate just yet. Okay. I do want to ask you before I let you go, um, as an American, uh, you obviously are British. Dave, our producer, is British as well. Um, the passing of Queen Elizabeth II uh, took place during the race weekend. And I'm just curious, um, as you witnessed that, and we saw plenty of statements from various drivers, from different teams, how did that passing impact the race weekend as you saw it? Yeah, I think Formula One... Uh wanted to pay tribute and they did with uh, a minute silence ahead of Friday practice. So the morning after the news and then another minute silence uh, ahead of the race, because that's a lot more public, a lot more people are tuned into the race than, than Friday practice. But equally, as, as a number of people said uh, in Formula One, that the teams, it's an international sport. You know, we saw a lot of football fixtures uh, get cancelled in the UK, but I don't really think that would have been right in Formula One, you know, the, the race was taking place in Italy. So I think they did the right thing. They paid their respects. A number of teams ran tributes. Um, and uh, given, you know, the fact that the Queen was at the very first Formula One race in 1950 at Silverstone, there's a connection there as well. So I think um, F1 kind of did the right thing, got the right message across and kind of yeah. uh, negotiated quite well. I'm glad to hear it. Very glad to hear it. Uh, Guys, as always. Uh, before we go, I have something for you. Uh -oh. It's April 10th, April 2022. Charles Leclerc and Ferrari have just won the Australian Grand Prix by 20 plus seconds. Charles leads Max Verstappen in the Drivers' Championship by 46 points. Max, quote, doesn't even want to think about the championship as it's more important to finish races. Just imagine. Why, Why are you doing that to Ferrari fans? Unbelievable. You have to bring that back up. They're starting, those wounds are starting to heal. They're starting to understand where they're at. But there's a great meme going around, which I saw today on Instagram, where it's Charles Leclerc's face in post race interviews after each, each race, and then also his points, either difference, you know, how much he's leading Verstappen by 
or how much he's behind. And you just see his face drop as it goes through the season. I know, of course, you pick the right screen grab and stuff like that, but still, it's it's true. And you know, it, I relate to it because you see that team and mm. the ambition and like how happy they were at the start of the year. Finally, Ferrari had a car capable of winning races after so many years of not quite being there. You know, certainly being a long way off Mercedes, and all of a sudden, it looked like they're in the championship challenge. And now, look where we are. So I, I always know. think of the uh, memes of pain or from Game of Thrones, shame, shame, shame. Yeah. It's, yeah, uh, mean, it's been a fall from grace for sure yeah, from where we started. Walking, Mattia Bonotto, if he, I think if he'd walked through Monza after Sunday night, <laughs> there would have been shame, shame, shame <laughs> around him, um, sadly. But hey, look, the Ferrari... Um, John Elkin, the Ferrari CEO, uh, was talking, or chairman, I think, was talking over the weekend and said that he expects the title by 2026. So that lifts a bit of pressure, right? I mean, that's a bit later than I think the rest of us were expecting it. But I thought he was yeah. going to say 2023. But yeah, so they have until 2026 to get it right. And he also put his full back in behind Mattia Bonotto. We've talked a lot on this podcast about yeah. should Ferrari make changes. But it looks like they're sticking with what they've got. And again, I'll make this point again. We've talked about it before as well. But... You know, this time last year, if you'd said like Ferrari would win three races the following year, that would be deemed kind of, you know, or four races, whatever it is, that would be deemed kind of acceptable. Actually, it's five races, I think. Anyway, that would be deemed kind of acceptable. And then obviously to, to fight for a championship, well, maybe next year. But um, there's clearly a few things they need to get sorted uh, before they're in a position to do that. Don't short them their wins this season, Lawrence. They need all the help they can get at this yeah, point. I'm sorry. I, I just, all I can think about right now is Max Verstappen, five consecutive wins. Yeah. It's quite hard to then go back through the other races and try and figure out where it was. But Yeah, yeah no doubt. It's been a long season. Uh, six more. You've got six more and you've got some time to rest and recover before you head to Singapore. As always, we appreciate your time and your analysis. We'll be back next week, guys. Until then. Remember to like and subscribe and give us a five-star rating so other F1 fans can find us. Cheers. Cheers.